Okay. <laughs> I'm being naughty. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. We like to hear some kind of response, right? The place is packed, everybody, and we wish you were here, though. But we're sorry that you can't be here, so we're bringing this to you live this evening. And we are blessed to do so. We're going to continue our study in the book of, in the uh, gifts of the Spirit today, tonight. And we're going to start with a word of prayer, and we're going to try to be serious here. So let's do that. Father, we first of all do want to give you thanks and praise and our love. Father, we are desirous to know you more. Lord, we're hungry for your spirit. We're hungry for your word. And so, Father, as we gather here this evening, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, that you would educate us as we look at this topic of of uh, governments, the gift of governments. And Lord, we do want to say a special prayer tonight, Lord, as we hold up all of those men and women who are out there fighting these fires and everything that goes along with that, all the complicated things that have to happen to make it work. We just pray for them. We pray for their safety. Lord, we pray that you would help these fires to go out. Lord, that you would bring uh, a change in the wind and you would bring moisture and that you would put these fires out, Lord. Just be with these folks who are losing their homes and provide for them. And I pray that they would look to you, that they would uh, cry out to you for help, that there would not be shaking of fists at you. But Lord, that you would just be merciful to them and bless them. And Father, protect our area and our town from those fires and we will continue to give you thanks and give you the glory for it all in Jesus name amen so obviously we got some serious stuff going on out there don't we with these fires <clears throat> I've never seen it like that before but uh, I wonder if it has anything to do with the times that we're living in I kind of been thinking about that. I bet you there's a lot of people that have been thinking about that. What is going on in our world, in our country? It's crazy, isn't it? Well, we're going to start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. I'm going to read it to you. We've read it several times already during the week, weeks, and I will read it once again. God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, Thirdly, teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Tonight we're going to take a look at the gift of government. Interesting study. Perhaps you might be thinking, oh, how boring can that be? But I think it's very interesting when we take a look at how governing has been established by God. And actually, the first mention of government in the Bible is in a prophecy. And that prophecy is found in the book of Isaiah in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. It says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice, from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Pretty powerful prophecy there, isn't it? And the first thing we can recognize is that <clears throat> we would call this, I guess if we wanted to put a tag on it, we would call it uh, the highest form of government being a monarchy. And it's a very efficient way to govern if you have 
a good monarch, right? That's the most important thing. And when Jesus comes, he will establish his government upon the earth, and he will reign as king of kings and lord of lords, and man will not be able to do that. Man will not be able to make that happen. It tells us at the very end of this prophecy that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so this is something that's going to be established by God and God alone. When our government was established, and any government that is established, you would think that they would establish those governments in order to protect people, to ensure peace, to enforce laws, uh, common welfare. Government should try to eliminate evil and pursue and preserve those things that are good. And there are people who God has gifted with these gifts of governing. Oftentimes we encounter people where we might say to them, wow, that guy's, he's a natural leader. He's a gifted leader. It just kind of comes natural for him. He has that, uh, that personality or that demeanor or whatever it might be uh, to where people are attracted to that particular person. As far as gifts go, I think that when we look around us, we find that God has gifted all of us, and we've learned this over and over again, with so many talents and so many gifts. People who play music, that's, that's a gift. It's a, it's a real, it's a gift. And, you know, I've heard it said that you either have it or you don't have it. You, you, you either keep a beat or you'll never keep a beat. I mean, it's kind of, it's a gift, you know. And some people struggle for years and years and years to try to master an instrument or some sort of music, and they just never get over that, that hump with it, unfortunately. But there are those who are gifted in that area, and they just excel. And, and we've seen that, we've heard it, we've witnessed it. And it's the same, oh, I don't know, somebody that is really good at doing calculations or designing things or mathematics or science or all of these different things, I believe, are gifts that God has given to all of us. But the most important thing about gifts really is that you're going to find whatever your gift is, that its highest use, its best expression is going to be when we do it to glorify the Lord when we do it as unto the Lord. And we look around and we see so many gifted people that are doing it not unto the Lord. They're doing it as unto themselves for their own profit or, or, or gain or, or, or just being noticed by people. But these gifts that God has given us are given to us in order that we might use them and bring glory to God, the one who gave us the gift. It's a natural thing to be thankful to the one who gives you a gift, don't you think? I mean, it's natural. It comes natural. If somebody gives you a gift, the first thing out of your mouth is, oh, thank you. That was so nice. And unfortunately, I think we have so many people that are gifted, but they don't really acknowledge the gift giver. They don't really know where the gift is coming from, and if they do, they don't care to acknowledge that, and they assume that this gift is because of how great they are, but it's a gift. Right? It's a gift that's been given by God. Now, throughout history, we're talking about governing here, and throughout history, there has been all kinds of governing experiments that have been tried. Some of the very earliest types of governing were developed in small villages, uh, between feuds, between different little groups of people, and they would rule over these little cities, and they would become monarchs, and as it would grow, they ultimately would be ruling over nations. And this, of course, would be that form of government known as a monarchy, one person in charge. Now, earlier I told you that, that uh, the governing design of God was a monarchy, but it was him who is in charge, not a man, not a man. It's always God that's in charge. Our government, interestingly enough, we call that a, uh, let me 
constitutional form of governing, a republic. And we have elected people to represent our views, to make the decisions and form laws and how the nation will be governed. We would like to think that that's the case. We would like to think that those people are representing us also realize that there is a God above them that they have to be responsible to when they make their decisions concerning governing. If they represent us and they don't represent us in the form of government that we would like them to, but perhaps they would say that they are going to do so, but once they're in office, once they have the power, if God is not their If they're not answering to God, then very quickly they become corrupt and greedy and power hungry and make decisions that are really, really strange for us to try to conceive of, such as um, some of the education that our kids are getting in school, so ungodly, Uh, passing out condoms. In schools, uh, teaching the, the uh, alternative lifestyles, if you might want to say it that way, as normal and acceptable and right and good. You know, every time I see a rainbow, it breaks my heart. And I know I'll get flack for saying this. But there is a group of people that stole the rainbow and they use it now to profess themselves as legitimate, but what was the rainbow for? It was God's promise to us about judgment. It's a holy thing. Every time you see that in the sky, it should remind you of God's promise not to destroy the earth by water ever, ever again. But these days, not so. And sometimes this is what happens with the leaders that are elected. They, they are crying out so loud for the opposition to allow these groups to dictate the climate of the country that we're going to live in. And if you say anything to these, those in opposition to a biblical form of government, right away they want to shout you down. They want to cry foul. They want to say that you're closed-minded. They want to say anything that they can say. Church and state separation, all that kind of a thing that they want to espouse when you're challenging them concerning these ideals and lack of ideals and values that they might have. And so these people are put into office and the voices are very, very loud. And unfortunately, it seems like the other voices on the more biblical side aren't very loud. It's though we're, that they're being shouted down. They're being noised out, if you will. And we're not trying, I'm not, I'm sure you're not, as a Christian, as a, as a Bible-believing person, I'm not trying to impose by law my values on anybody. And I don't think it's right to do that. But you know, The the separation of church and state when it comes to morality and when it comes to decency and when it comes to common sense. We, We know that moral issues make a nation strong or destroy that nation. That's a historical fact. We've seen it over and over throughout time. And so it's not the issue that the church is trying to impose itself on society although it would seem as though the other side would like to impose their will on society. And it's okay to do that, and you know and you see it very clearly, they impose very low standards for our country and for what we believe and what we hold to be true and and decent. There's different types of issues that are brought up And, well, let's just bring one up. How about abortion? Let's talk about abortion for a second. To me, sitting here tonight, it's inconceivable that we could murder unborn human beings and say it's okay that it's my right to do that. 
What's the difference if I walked out of here and shot somebody in the street and said, it's my right to do that? There's not much difference. As a matter of fact, I just recently watched a documentary about a gal who was the uh, CEO, the big cheese over there at uh, Planned Parenthood. Never went to medical school, wasn't a doctor, she was an executive, and she was in executive offices and got paid executive monies, and, and they needed her to come in and assist one day. She had never even been around an abortion, and she was called into this room to assist because the assisting nurse could not be there, and they had it on a uh, what do you call that when you, you can see it on the screen? When they do the thing and you can see what ultrasound. They had it on an ultrasound. And she sat there and watched as they injected this fluid in there to kill this child. She watched this little unborn baby trying to defend itself and trying to push away from it and struggling to breathe as it inhaled this toxin. And she watched that baby die in that woman's womb. And it changed her life. She resigned. She quit. Because she finally got to see how ugly and how horrible and how evil it was. Now she's an advocate against it, of course. But we're allowing that in our society without remorse. Now, I don't believe for one second that God is just going to sit by and allow that to continue, that that cup of wrath is going to be filled, it's going to overflow, and it's going to be one of many justifications for God judging this nation, and he will be judging our nation. They scream, oh, very, very loud about their right to take life. Why is that? We have a good form of government. We have a good system. It's set up good. Why is it that it's so corrupt? Well, it's because we have corrupt leaders. It's because we put corrupt leaders in office with our ballot. And by the way, while we're talking about it, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm not going to bother to vote. Doesn't make any difference anyway. You know, it's true here where we live, usually on election night, the the presidency is decided long before our votes are even ever counted on the federal level. But don't you think we have a responsibility when it comes to local government, when it comes to state government, to put people in Washington that will make good decisions and see things for what they really are? I think that it's really important that we participate in that process that we get out there from the city all the way up to the county, to the state, you can make a difference if you go out and vote your values. Personally, the way I feel about it, there's one thing that matters to me, and that's the topic we were just talking about. If anybody wants to promote that topic, they don't have my support. If anybody's against that topic, they'll have my support. Because I know that it's not the other stuff that's going to bring judgment on this nation. It's the murder of children that's going to bring judgment upon this nation. Anyway, enough of that. Let's, I'm sorry, I kind of got off on a tangent there. I wasn't planning on doing that. <clears throat> Bottom line is this. Every form of government that's been devised by man has been unsuccessful. It's all failed. We're about as close as you can get to good governing, but man has definitely proven throughout the ages that we are incapable of governing ourselves. We're incapable because we're corrupt. And ultimately, we corrupt and destroy the form of government the very form of government that we tried to uh, establish. We're incapable. God did endorse and establish 
I like this one better. A theocracy form of government. I like that better than the earlier one we used because theo means God. It means governed by God, literally. That's what it meant for Israel. When, when Jacob's name was changed to Israel, you translate Israel, you know what it means? Governed by God. That was the established governing system that was set up by God for the nation of Israel. And we know from reading our Bible that Moses was God's representative. He was the leader of the people. But Moses was the accepted earthly leader. However, he was also being guided and governed himself by God. Very important. See, this is transferable to every person that we have running for office today. Are they being governed by God in any way, shape, or form? Or are they being governed by their own agenda? Well, mostly probably by their own agenda. But we shouldn't be shocked. Because the fact is, we cannot. And we are incapable of governing ourselves apart from God. People want a representative to represent them. I remember reading in the Old Testament concerning Moses. And in Deuteronomy, there's this really, actually it's a very cool story. The children of Israel are at Mount Sinai and they see the fire and the thunder and the rolling and the, the sounds and everything. And, and they know it's God. And, and, and instead of them going, we want to go up to the mountain of God, what did they do? They went to Moses and they said, Mo, you go talk to him. You go up there. That's scary stuff. That's powerful. We don't want, you go and find out what he has to say, and then you come back and tell us all about it. He was the designated leader. You go talk to him. And so the people... This is very important. The people recognized in that moment, in that sense, that God was the, that Moses was the man that God had directed to lead the people. They didn't suggest anybody else. They wanted to send Moses. And that consciousness in Israel that God reigns, that God rules over the nation, even in the design of their, their camp, when they would set up camp after they would be traveling and they set up camp, the tabernacle would be in the middle and all the tribes would set their tents up around it and every tent would face the tabernacle. And every time you walk out of your house, your tent, whatever you want to call it, the first thing you would see and be reminded of was that God was in the center of your life, that God was in the center of governing your life. They were being governed by God. And he made, a, he made a covenant with them. And that covenant still exists today. That covenant, he said, if you will follow me, if you will allow me to govern you, if you will obey my commandments, if you will follow after me, you'll be given power and greatness and strength and prosperity and blessing. And he said, none of the plagues that came upon Egypt will come upon you. But it will come upon your enemies. You're going to be lenders and not borrowers, he said, if you'll follow me, if you'll let me rule over you. But then, of course, the other side of the coin was he predicted the consequences that would come to them when they turned away from him. He predicted that when they refused to follow his rule, when they would no longer obey, there would be disastrous results. And there were. The nation was destroyed. You see, the nation began to allow those things that were done in secret that nobody spoke of to be done in the open. You know, we see the same thing going on in our country in the last 50 years or whatever, how long it's been. Those things that weren't spoken of, those things that were in the shadows, those things that were shameful, 
They were taking place, yeah. But now, they're taking place out in the open. They're accepted as normal behavior. And this was going on in Israel, and they were turning away from God. They were turning away from God's Spirit directing their paths. I love that, that, that scripture that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Isn't that beautiful? That's powerful. That's kind of like a preamble to life, you know? It's really, really powerful. A lot of people will blame God for things that take place in their life. And we forget, or they forget, or even we forget sometimes, we are living in a fallen world. We're living in a world where sin is entered in, and that plague of sin and corruption and death is upon every living thing. You know, the Bible tells us that the whole world groans for the return of Jesus, to put things back the way they were supposed to be in the first place. Now, when Moses was ruling over his people, of course, we also know by, from Scripture that the job got pretty tough. They were rebellious. They were constantly fighting him. They were questioning his authority. Who gave Moses that authority? Well, God gave it to him. Moses' whole life was, was such that God was preparing him for this particular ministry of leading the nation of Israel out of bondage. He was given the law to give to... He was, he was the man who brought the law from God to the people. And this is how you are to live. We call them the Ten Commandments, of which, unfortunately, we've chosen to ignore and take down from, from our institutions in this country. You see, the very same thing that's happening in our country today happened in Israel. And Israel was taken captive. They were ruined as a nation. And the only thing that brought them back to be a nation today was God's grace and God's mercy and God's heart for that nation and the promises that he made to their fathers. He, pro he made a promise to them. And, and, and it's unbelievable that in spite of our sinful nature, God is still able to keep his promises to the people. In spite, you know, they became very debased. They did horrible things before they were taken into captivity. They continued to listen to bad counsel. They continued to listen to propaganda. They continued to live in the flesh. They continued to see what they were going to get out of the deal. That's what it's all about, isn't it? What I can get from them. I thought it was supposed to be about what I can contribute to them. But it seems like we have this new mentality today. It's all about what I can take from them for free. It's a sad place that we're in. So Moses was a man who was filled with the Spirit. Moses went to the Lord and he said, You know what, Lord? I didn't, these aren't my kids. <laughs> I didn't give birth to these kids. These are your kids. And, and I can't deal with them anymore. I've done my best. They're thirsty, I got, we got them water. They're hungry, manna comes down from heaven and they're still rebelling. They're still complaining, they're still murmuring, they're still questioning whether or not you have placed me in this position of leadership or I've put myself in this position. God put his spirit upon Moses and, 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 and God had a plan. He said, I want you to find some guys who also are men of integrity. I want you to find some men who have the Spirit in them and let them hear the people's complaints. And so he winds up appointing 70 elders. And in turn, they took a lot of that load off of Moses. Instead of serving tables and handling domestic disputes, Moses was able to seek God while they were dealing with these other things, and if they had an issue that they couldn't resolve, then they would bring it to him 
And Moses, in turn, would take it to God. And the people were aware, and they were very conscious at that time that God was reigning over them, and he was using human instruments to represent him to the people. What an awesome thing. It's glorious. When, when, when this works the way it's designed to work, when we remember that truly it is God who rules. So we've got lots of rules when it comes to ruling. 2 Samuel 23, 3 says that the God of Israel said, this is Samuel speaking, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He that rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Well, there's a nice qualification right there. Ruling in the fear of God. I think it would be safe to say scripturally that if you don't have the fear of God in your life, then you have no right to rule over your fellow man. I think it would be safe to say that you're not qualified. It would be safe to say that any man who does not have God's fear in his life will become corrupt. He will become dishonest. In uh, Romans chapter 12, Paul's talking about these gifts of governments. And uh, speaking of it, he said, he that rules should rule with diligence. That's a, in other words, it's an awesome, huge responsibility that, you've, that you're taking to represent God to the people. That's what Moses did. See, God doesn't want to be misrepresented. I don't want to be misrepresented. We don't want to be misrepresented, especially in our social political arenas that we have to deal with. We want our voices to be heard. God doesn't want to be misrepresented either. I don't think it pleases him when people say, well, you know, God said when he didn't. That goes on a lot, doesn't it? Well, God said that we should do this or we should do that when God didn't say it at all. I think that makes the Lord unhappy. As a matter of fact, it makes him so unhappy. This is what he said about them. He said, whoa, be unto the prophets. In other words, they're going to have to answer to God. Well, God said, hey, they're misrepresenting God. Now, it even goes further than that. When we remove God completely out of the discussion, that's where we're at today in so many areas and in so many ways. So we have this, this lead role of leadership who must be in the fear of God. And Paul said ruling with diligence and making sure that we don't misrepresent God to the people. That was what happened to Moses. That's why Moses wasn't able to go into the promised land because he misrepresented God to the people. And you might remember what I'm talking about. And they came and they were going to stone Moses because they said, we're dying of thirst and we're sorry we ever came out here. We were crazy to listen to you. And they wanted to execute him. And Moses obviously, bummed out, upset, he went to the Lord. He said, I don't like the way people are treating me. I'm going to give you my letter of resignation. I'm done. And he said, Mo, go back over to the rock and speak to the rock. Now, what happened the first time when this incident came up in the wilderness and it's the same, you know, it's this big, huge rock that's out there in the middle of the desert. You can find it. You can see it today where this ap actually happened. With a rock split like this and water just poured out down into this empty reservoir. And it filled it up with water and it was able to, to, to give million plus people the water they needed to live. But it dried up and it began to get thirsty again. But the Lord told him, I want you to smite that rock three times the first time, which he did, and the rock broke and the water came out. And we know from the Bible that the New Testament tells us that that was a picture of Jesus. 
He's the rock. He's the one that allowed that living water to flow forth from him. But he had to be smitten. And three days and three nights he was in the tomb and he rose from the dead. He was smitten. One, two, three, he, smit, he hit that rock. And now it's come full circle and the people are complaining again. And Moses goes to God and God says, hey, Mo, just go up to the rock and speak to it. Ask and it will be given to you. Well, Mo, he wasn't paying much attention. He was angry at the people, right? Now, remember, he's God's representative to the people. So when he went to the people, he said to them, what do I have to do to you know, let me read this here. Uh, Numbers 20. He said, Moses, go out and speak to the rock so the water might come forth for them. And Moses went out to the people and he said, you rebels. <laughs> Can you imagine preaching a sermon like that? You rebels. How long do I have to put up with you? Must I smite this rock again to give you water? And he took his rod and he smote the rock. Bad move, Mo. Come here, son, God said. Got to have a talk. I didn't, what did I ask you to do? What were my instructions? Didn't I ask you to speak to the rock? I was so upset. Lord, God, I'm so sorry. I was just so angry at the people. Yeah, but see, Mo, here's the problem. You were representing me before those people. And those people think I'm mad at them. Those people think that I'm throwing them under the bus because of how you treated them. And why was it that Moses wasn't able to do this? Well, I have my own theory on that. I believe that Moses was a man who represented law. He was black and white with Moses. He, he, he received the law and he gave it to the people. And he's like telling God, he's saying, you know, 40 years I've been putting up with these people. At one point, he, he didn't even want to have that job anymore. He wanted to retire. And God told him, you know what? You didn't represent me very well, Mo. You represent the law very well. But you don't represent my grace very well. You don't represent my love and mercy for the people very well. And because of that, you will not be able to enter into the promised land. Because the promised land is all about my promises. It's about my grace. It's about my mercy. And you're a man of law. I don't even know if Moses could even begin to comprehend that idea of grace. And so he was not allowed to go in. He misrepresented God. And I think that we have to be really, really careful when we rule, when God gives us uh, a ministry like that, that we do not misrepresent him. Now, what about our own personal life? How many of us Mo's are running around all legaled out and everything, and we're pointing that finger and condemning everybody, and they're all thinking, oh, man, God, he's a mean old man with a big white beard and a club, you know, just waiting to squish me like a bug. You're misrepresenting God. We're not showing that grace. We're not showing that mercy. We're not showing that love. In Proverbs 12, 24, it says, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule. And I think that's what Paul's talking about when in Romans when he talks about ruling with diligence, representing God in the right way. And, you know, Jesus talked about it. He talked about it over in the book of Mark. He talks about how the Gentiles exercise lordship. And their great ones exercise authority, but it should not be like that among you. Whoever wants to be great should be your minister. Whoever of you would be the chief should be the servant. Because he said, even the Son of Man did not come to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus said to his disciples the very night that they were betrayed and he took the towel. And he gave them a lesson that's been handed down for 2,000 years. And he began to wash their feet. The master, the Lord, the creator, washing their feet. I'm giving you an example, he said, of how you are to rule over the people. Now, I've got to be honest. I've never washed anybody's feet before. 
But I think that figuratively speaking, this is what Jesus is talking about. Maybe not so much literally washing people's feet. I thought about being at the front door on Sunday with a rag and a towel as people come in and just kind of wash, you know. Of course not. It would be a spectacle. It would put more attention on me than it would on Jesus, right? Oh, my gosh, he's washing people's feet. Oh, what a great man that is. Oh, my. No. But Jesus is saying, I'm giving you an example of how you should lead, how you should exercise your leadership. Be a servant. Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, he said, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. So the bishop was an overseer. He was like a ruler or a governor, if you will, over the body of Christ. And the English word bishop in the Greek is the word, see if I can say this right, episcopus. Episcopus. And this is where we get the word Episcopalian. From that word bishop. The Episcopalian church, it follows the form of government with bishops in each church. One bishop in each church. And then there's another word Paul talks about, the elders. And the Greek word for elders is presbyteros. Presbyterian. Thus, we get the Presbyterian church. They call themselves Presbyterians because the form of government which they rule by is done by a board of elders, or presbytos. And so, on one side of the street, we have the Presbyterian. On the other side, we have the Episcopalian. And you know what separates them? That very thing. They can't seem to figure out which one of them are right. They can't seem, so they split up. And thus we have a division between the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians over whether or not the church should be ruled by a bishop or by a board of elders. That's the difference. Isn't that sad? Maybe reading this and looking at this, I might right away say, oh, well, we have a contradiction in the Bible here. It must not be the Word of God. It's contradicting itself. Maybe it's not. Maybe Paul's encouraging to have a bishop along with the elders to help the bishop rule. Oh, what a novel idea. But no, it's got to be either or. So now we have these two great denominations that disagree about this one thing. It's kind of unfortunate, I think, that there would be such a division between saints over this issue when Paul, I believe, wholeheartedly was talking about encompassing the two together in a form of governing uh, God's people. Now, when he's talking about the overseer, the bishop, this is what he says about them. They must be blameless. (gasps) Disqualified. Is anybody blameless? You want to be a bishop? You want to be a pastor? Are you blameless? Sorry, none of us are blameless. I'm disqualified right there. I haven't even got into the husband of one wife part yet. And I'm disqualified. He must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach, not given to wine or striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, ooh, not a brawler, ooh, and not covetous. One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how can he take care of the church of God? He should not be a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Boy, that happens a lot. We hear about it a lot. We hear a lot about pastors who have fallen. Because they were put in the place too soon, or perhaps not even called to be in that position. So as Paul lists these, again, qualifications for a pastor, I think we're all eliminated. You know, really. So how is it that I can find myself qualifying in that, in that particular instruction that Paul's giving? That very first requirement. 
To me, it's kind of crazy how some people will jump on some requirements and kind of overlook others. The divorce thing's a big one. I know great men of God in their prior lives. They had a marriage. They weren't walking with the Lord. They got a divorce. They became born again. They got into the ministry. They got married. And now they want to pastor a church. And some of the groups are saying, eh, you're disqualified. Because you're not the husband of one wife. You've had two. You really think that's what Paul was talking about? I don't think so. I think he's talking about polygamy. I think he's talking about having more than one wife at the same time. Oh, I know a group that does that. You guys know about that group? I do. So there's some things in the list that seem to be certain to disqualify us. But here's the thing. No man can really, none of us, and, and, he, and he talks about this in the qualification part, none of us can have leadership over others unless we're very conscious of the fact that I can't rule anybody if I'm not being ruled. I can't rule over my own family properly if I'm not being ruled by God. How can I rule over the family of God if I can't take care of my own family? So I say the fear of God is so important. It's a necessary trait for a person who wants to be in leadership, whether it be in the church or in the home or in government or anything like that. And I also think that God has established a chain of authority in the Bible. You remember when Jesus encountered the centurion, and, and I believe his daughter was sick and dying. And Jesus was going to go and lay hands on her or raise her up or whatever. And you know what the centurion said? He said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. I understand authority, he said. I'm a centurion. I understand. I have men under me and I command them. And I have men over me that command me. I understand the chain of command. I'm under authority, but I have authority over others. So all you got to say, Lord, is she's good, right? And I'll accept that and I'll know that it's right you have the authority to do that. So all these chains of command that we see in the Bible, always God is at the top of that list, at the top of that chain, and everything underneath it needs to be very aware that it's being allowed to do so, excuse me, by the authority of God and not the authority of men. Because we become tyrants. We become angry. We, we become frustrated. We become impatient. And, and, and we start taking burdens upon ourselves that God never intended for us to take. He that rules over man must be just. Today we got a really bad situation in our country. We have people who are guilty of horrible violations of their authority all over the place. They like to treat others as though they're God. They're not realizing that they're supposed to represent God in their judgment. They're beginning to believe that they truly are God. There was a guy in the Old Testament that that happened to. As a matter of fact, this guy in the Old Testament is said that perhaps was the greatest secular leader in history. And that was Nebuchadnezzar. You might remember the vision that Daniel had concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He saw a big giant statue, and the head was made out of gold. And as the the interpretation came to Nebuchadnezzar, um, these images of these different governments of men, he was the head. He was superior to all other kingdoms. And every kingdom after Babylon was inferior to the Babylonian kingdom. It's history. Just like silver is inferior to gold, so the kingdom is inferior to the Babylonian kingdom. And we see this natural, gradual degrading all the way down to the feet of iron and clay. Much like what we see going on around us right now. Isn't it amazing? 
when you look at it like that, when you can see so clearly that, oh my goodness, we're on the very same path. History is repeating itself. We're not learning from history because we can't. And because of his greatness and how awesome Nebuchadnezzar was, he began to rule out God. He began to think that he was at the top, that he was the final authority. And he was in for a rude awakening, wasn't he? The Bible says he was lifted up with pride and God humbled him. He allowed him to experience a time of insanity. Sometimes he does that in our lives. Sometimes he does that in people's lives. He allows us to go through things so that we might wake up to what's really going on, to the intent that he would know that the Most High God rules every kingdom on the earth, and he gives it to who he wants to give it to. That's another thing that Nebuchadnezzar learned, the Most High God. How long? Well, he says, I'm going to turn you into the basest of men. Until you know, God said to Nebuchadnezzar, that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. Daniel 4. So even today, during the time of Moses, we had this great need for good leaders. People who would lead the nation. And as Moses began to understand that his time was drawing short, he came to God and he said, Lord, who's going to take my place? What's going to happen? I can't go in. What's going to happen next? He said, let the Lord, the God of spirits of all flesh, put a man over the congregation which might go out before them and which may go in before them and which may lead them out and which may bring them in that the congregation of the Lord will not be as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit. And lay your hand on him and set him before Eliezer the priest and before the congregation and give him a charge in their sight. And you shall put some of your honor upon him that all of the congregation of the children of Israel would be obedient and he shall stand before Eliezer the priest who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. And at his word shall they go out. And at his word shall they come in, both he and the children of Israel with him, even all of the congregation. And so here we have another qualification for leadership, that he has to be a man who has the Spirit, a man who is governed by the Spirit. And so we had an establishing of Moses' replacement. And through, even though Moses died... God's reign continued over the nation. And it wasn't diminished because the next man came in. It continued to go forward. It continued to grow because it was under the guidance and the direction of God. Until, of course, the people rebelled. And the consequence of bringing in new leaders, poor leaders, the nation was destroyed. Proverbs 29, 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the, wicked are, but when the wicked are bearing rule, the people mourn. Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful to read something like that in the day that we live in today. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch out for your soul so that they might give an account so that they might do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, another type of governing. We've talked about Episcopal and and, uh, Presbyterian. We talked about these two. There's another one that's out there, and it's called the shepherding movement. Maybe you haven't heard of it. Shepherding movement is a group of people who take this scripture that I just read, one scripture, and they hold people in bondage in their churches. The pastors. They say that they are to obey them who have the rule over them and submit 
themselves because after all, the Bible says, they're there to watch after your soul. What does that mean? How they translated that into their church government. We call it the shepherding doctrine. And this is where a person in the church can't make any decision. Okay, think about this. You're in this church that you go to, and you're not allowed to make decisions on your own. You want to buy a car? You're not to buy it unless you go and ask permission. Clothing? Shoes? Marriage? You have to get permission to do so. How sad is that? How controlling is that? How legalistic is that? That's not the way God established churches to be governed. That's what happens when we take Scripture out of context and we build a whole doctrine around it. So I want to sum this up. We've taken a look at several different types of governing in the Bible and in our society. And you kind of wonder, well, what about Calvary? You see, whenever you have a chain of command, the final authority must be God. And at Calvary Chapel, this form of governing was developed which I guess you could say is kind of a theocratic form of government. We recognize that Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the final authority over all the decisions that are deferred to him. There's many decisions made within the church that we can just make because they're common sense decisions to make. But there are those decisions that we need to bring before God. We defer them to Him. And, and we have a group of men, a church board. Big giant churches have big giant boards because they have so many people to be on the board. But you have the bishop and then you have the board or the elders on the board. Which is the two combined together to create the one governing system. And at every board meeting, when we come together, we recognize and we discuss the various needs, the things that need to be done in the church, how we're going to get there, how we're going to implement them. But one of the things that we do that are most important of all is we pray. And we seek God's guidance. We discuss the various needs and the different directions that God might want us to go. We're not there to rule. We're not there to even make decisions, actually. We're there to find out what his decisions are and to implement his will and his desire according to his word. That's our desire. That's our governing. You see, there's another one, too. I'm going to mention it real quick. It's called congregational governing. Now, this one's really wacko because you don't even see this. Anytime you've ever seen congregational governing in the Bible, it was a disaster. As a matter of fact, it was congregational governing that attempted to overthrow Moses. It was the congregation that was complaining. They wanted to fire him. They wanted to stone him. But that's not what God established. That's not how he had set it up. But now in churches today, we have this congregational form of governing. You have a group of people that come together and they vote and they decide on whether or not you can still be their pastor or not. Or they vote on the color of the paint or the carpet or who's going to sit where. It becomes ridiculous. And here's the thing about the danger of congregational governing. And that would be, it's much the same as the system where you only have the elders making the decisions. Much the same, because that's a smaller congregation. But you have men with their own intentions. You, we don't know what you're doing out there during the week. And you're going to sit in here and you're going to raise your hand and you're going to vote as to what direction God wants this church to go to. And we don't know what kind of person you are. Oh, you got baptized. And yes, you joined the church. And you're on paper. So you get to raise your hand and you get to vote. But we don't know what your heart's like. See, that's the danger of a congregational government. You could have predators out there, drug addicts out there, 
perverts out. You could have all kinds of people sitting in there with their little nice Sunday outfit on, making decisions on what direction the church is going to go. That's dangerous. It doesn't work. It breaks my heart every time I hear, yeah, we're on our fifth pastor this year. It's like, oh my gosh. I'm so glad we don't do that here. I would have probably got fired a long time ago. I would have got voted out of here years ago. But here's the thing, and, and I'm, I'll share my heart real quick with this one. How do I say this right? If God has called me to be a pastor in this church, in this, in this community, and I believe he has, and you agree with that, and you choose to partner in this ministry, you choose to be part of this church. There's no membership. You can't join Calvary Chapel West Valley. If you're a believer in Jesus and you want to fellowship with us, then you're part of the fellowship. If a person is here and they think that perhaps the pastor has got his eyeballs on his wife or his car, or his money, then you should probably go somewhere else. You see, I believe that when God calls a person to go to ministry like he has, to do the great things that he has done here with all of us working together, it's not about the pastor, it's about all of us. Believing that God has called the pastor to be the pastor, there's an element of trust that goes with that. There's an element of commitment that goes with that. And if that commitment is not able to be found, then it's counterproductive to stay. So over the years, there has been many that have decided, no, I don't want to be a part of that, I'm going to move on. But here's the thing. They can move on, and that's fine. The door is open. It swings both ways. They came in freely. They can walk out freely. There's no hard feelings. I don't take it personal. But I do pray to God that those who do come in would share that vision as a body, as a group of people together. We're all spokes in the wheel, all of us. Anybody that ministers is like a spoke, and we minister to the congregation. And at the middle of the wheel isn't the pastor, it's Jesus. We're just spokes, reaching out and ministering and holding it together, keeping it balanced. And so why God puts, while God puts one in one position and one in another position, there's got to be that element of trust. I'm glad that I don't have to rest my hopes and dreams on what God called me to do upon what somebody who doesn't really favor me feels like. I'm glad that Calvary Chapel has the kind of governing system that it has. Many would say, hey, there's just way too much authority there. Well, you know what? I'll stand before God and I'll be accountable. And if I've done that, I'll be accountable for it and I'll be disciplined for it. And the ministry won't be blessed. But look around and look what God's doing. How great God has been to Calvary Chapel West Valley. Even just sitting in this room tonight is a reminder of how awesome God has been to us. And so while there are many different ways of governing a church, sometimes trial and error, if you're willing to commit trial and confess error, it kind of brings you to this place of balance where you have Jesus at the head. You have the shepherd or the bishop. You have the elders around the bishop. And then you have the people of God. I believe that's how God ordained it to be. And uh, a lot of people will dispute that. But 
We have this book here. It's called Calvary Distinctives. And if you've never read it before, I would encourage you to read it. I have copies of it. But this book tells you everything that we and why we do what we do uh, in Calvary Chapel Ministries. This is what Chuck wrote. We believe that God's model is more uh, that we did not create a Presbyterian form of government. It was more of an Episcopos form of government for Calvary Chapel. We believe that God's model is that the pastor is ruled by the Lord and he's aided by the elders to discover the mind and the will of Jesus Christ for his church. That kind of simplifies it right there. That puts it in just a very few words. Denominations can be very, very destructive and very much hinder. There was an instance when you would go into the, uh, did we just lose it? When you would go into uh, a church like we're in right now and you're all sitting in your pew or they'd have chairs all lined up and you walk in one night and you say, you know, I think God might want to do something different tonight. Let's put all the chairs in a big circle and just get a chair and I'll sit down and we'll teach and we'll just discuss and pray together in a circle. And then the elders of the church find out what you did. And they come to you and they say, oh no, that's not acceptable. You need to put the chairs back the way they were, put everybody in their place, and do your three hymns, scream at them for 30 minutes, and then send them home. That's what we do here. Yeah, but I just felt like God was inspiring me to, showing me that, man, this is going to be great, and this is warm, and it's exciting, and it's, you know, don't you ever let that happen again. Well, there's a denomination holding on so tight to its rigors that it's not giving God any room to work. You remember what Jesus talked about with those wineskins? Huh? Some folks are walking around, their old wineskin is just so dried up and stiff, and they can't accept anything new or different because their little wineskin will break. Let's keep our skin soft, folks. Blessed are the flexible, for they will not be broken. Amen? Father, thank you for our time tonight. Thank you for this awesome topic. And Lord, help us to govern faithfully. Help us, Lord, to love your people, no matter what. Give us your love for them. Help us to forgive one another and to overlook one another's faults and to realize that we're all just sinners saved by grace. We're all in the same boat rowing together to try to reach our destination. And you, you're our captain. You lead the way. You show us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the examples that we have in it of success and failure. Bless us, Lord, tonight as we leave. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for joining us. We went over a little bit. <laughs>